It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I wasn't expecting this size crowd. I was expecting about uh, 20 people, I was told. There were going to be about 20 people, so this is fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I have to figure this out, uh, space, uh, space constraints. So um, why Chicago Foundation for Women, who we are and what we do? How many of you have heard of us before this? Very good, a few men in the room and not that many women who know about us. This is very surprising, nevertheless. That's perfect for what I'm gonna talk about. So uh, just a little bit about who we are and what we do and why we do what we do. So what we hope to achieve is to build strong communities for all by investing in women and girls. Why women and girls, you ask? So we believe that when you invest in women and girls, you invest in families, you invest in communities. And just a, a sense of what, what difference does it make if you invest in women. Let's, let's look at some statistics. So the cost of violence against women is huge. It costs $5.8 billion a year. And every dollar invested in ending violence against women gets you a return of $17. If you think about health disparities, black women diagnosed in, with breast cancer are, less, are, are likely, 39% more likely to die. Now, breast cancer, sh women should not be dying from breast cancer in 2017. The fact that this is happening in 2017 is just not acceptable. And then the much ballyhooed and much discussed cost of inequality in terms of the wage gap. Just in Illinois, women lose about $39 billion a year. And just think about what this means for our economy at this time um, in our state. So closing the gender gap, according to the McKinsey Global Institute, could drive $60 billion to to Illinois by the year 2025, if we were to do certain things. So with, with all these returns, you would think that more people would want to invest in issues that affect women and girls, correct? So in 1985, the number, uh, the amount of investment was 3%. Uh, in, 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 through institutional philanthropy for women and for issues affecting women and girls. Today that number is around 8%. So 17% return, you're only putting 8% in ch making change. $60 billion, you're only putting 8%. So not, not a fair comparison. Uh, let me put all of this stuff up. So what do we do about this and how do we try to change uh, what, what is happening in our state and in our region? We invest in the community, particularly in three issue areas. The first is economic security, enhancing economic security, addressing sort of that wage gap, the asset gap, uh, getting women into, into jobs that pay better and, and move up career ladders. The second is in the area of health and health information. You just um, saw the number about health disparities among African-American women. There are many such disparities across the spectrum and we focus a lot of our attention and a lot of our investments on women's health, particularly on reproductive health and justice. And finally, freedom from violence. And this includes issues like uh, domestic violence or intimate partner violence, sexual assault, um, and, and more recently human trafficking, sex trafficking of women and girls in our region. Um, what we believe is that taken together, the combination of these three issue areas really make a difference. If you address these three issue areas, those really make a difference in the lives of women and help them be strong, stable, and, and grow over time. The way we do our work is in, in really in three main areas. One is through grant making. We offer grants to organizations, to nonprofit organizations that work with women and girls in the three issue areas that I mentioned. We also fund advocacy as well as doing our own advocacy. And we build the leadership of women, particularly women leaders of color. 
And finally, a, a thing that we don't often talk about, but I want to share with you tonight, is that we are really organizing for change. All of this with a gender lens. So our grant making is in the six county region. It is in the six county region and it, you know, so that's Cook and the surrounding counties. And so we, we fund as far north as Zion and Waukegan, as far west as Naperville and Joliet, and as far south as Evergreen Park. Those dots just, uh, the different colors just show the different uh, types of grants we make based on the different issue areas. So since 1985, we've awarded nearly 4,000. This is really hard for me to do, try to do three things. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a multitasker, as you can tell. Uh, 4,000 grants over $30 million that have been invested in the Chicago community uh, so that women can be safe, healthy, and secure. So last year, we made 107, we, we supported 107 grantees um, with $1.9 million giving, and, and, with, and most of what we do is through community giving. So we raise money in order to make the grants we do. So we had 2,285 donors, as well as 118 community donors through giving through community philanthropy or what we call our giving councils. Um, and what this did last year was impact more than 90,000 people, two-thirds of which were women, and um, as you would expect, but also a significant number of men and those who were gender non-conforming. So more recently, our year just ended in June, uh, the 20, 2017 for us just ended in June and we made $2.3 million in, in grants in the three issue areas that I mentioned. So this is all very fine and good, so what's, what's the point of, of uh, making these investments in the community? So that kind of superficial data all of us can collect, all of us do collect and all of us must collect. But beyond the obvious, CFW is really interested in using data, um, you know, f certainly to tell, talk about the number of people served, certainly to talk about the gaps, uh, certainly to develop priorities for our own grant making and for our own advocacy, and also to help set priorities. But beyond this, we also use data in, in a couple of different ways that I, I'd like to share with you. The first one is we commission research and evaluation, which goes beyond sort of the superficial, goes beyond the obvious. Most recently, we supported um, a report called Damage Done, the impact of the St Illinois state budget. And you can see kind of the data that came from, from this report. And while it is things that we knew intuitively that as, as an organization, we knew the impact it had on our grantee and grantee organizations, it is not enough to say, oh, I know this stuff intuitively. Um, so part of it was sort of understanding in numbers the long-term effects of not having a state, bu state budget for over two years. This has really long-lasting consequences for Illinois, for the families, as well as for the organizations that serve the families. <clears throat> we also support policy change. You know, ultimately, $2.3 million in grants a year is not going very far if we are to make fundamental change. We must change laws and policies. And so Chicago Foundation for Women last year supported more than 30 laws that got passed um, in support of gender equity in the, it, it, not only in Chicago, but in Cook County as well as across the state. Here, these are just three examples. Uh, thanks to the work of uh, the organizations we support, Chicago and Cook County have paid sick leave. Uh, we, incre we were able to increase the minimum wage and now have basic protections for 
uh, those who care for our uh, near and dear ones. So this is sort of one example of what CFW has done in order that goes beyond sort of the superficial numbers of what we do. The second is this large project that I want to talk to you about called the 100% project. And the, what is the 100% project? So we call it the all out, all in effort to increase women's economic security and put an end to gender bias in Chicago. So this is um, a project that we came to after talking to more than 500 women and men, girls and boys across the region to tell us kind of what were some of the best solutions to get us to gender equity in our region. We all know the issues, we all hear about the issues, we all experience the issues, but what is it that is really going to get us to a solution and what is going to get us to, to equity? So I, perhaps I should start by saying what do, what do I mean by gender equity and then talk about how, how do we get there. So for us, gender equity means ensuring structural equality for women and girls and boys and men. The, that everybody has equal rights, equal opportunity, privilege and social power dynamics. We envision a society in which institutions, policies, culture, and personal action respect every person's inherent value and dignity. A commitment to ending gender bias for us means the challenging, the exploitation of women and girls while inviting men and boys as allies to challenge this unequal power dynamic and join forces to achieve the goal of gender equity. And so we actually hope to get there by the year 2030, not a long time left. So uh, there are sort of three strategies that we're employing in order to get to gender equity, to what we want to achieve. Um, and we're thinking of the three strategies, I'll name them. The first is to understand and break bias. We believe that sort of the root cause of uh, discrimination, the root causes of violence against women is bias and so we need to understand and break bias. The second is to build strong partnerships and collaboration and truly unlikely partners and collaborators. You know, people, when I told people I was coming to Shy Hack Night, they were like, why are you going there? What, what does that have to do? And this is part of it for us is about building unusual partnerships and, and really understanding how we, we can work with such a diverse group of people with such a broad range of interests and such deep backgrounds in so many different areas. And then finally, the third area is developing policies and legislation. You heard a bit about the, the legislation that we fund, but there are lots of things where um, corporations can think about the policies, the HR policies they have within their organizations, which will get to economic parity for, for women in their companies. So the question always comes up. So gender equity by the year 2030, how are you going to know you're there? What, how are you going to measure it? What, what are you going to do? So we are committed to uh, to reporting on the progress or lack thereof uh, every year. So what we're using is uh, the, the information from a report by the McKinsey Global Institute. So McKinsey is a well-respected entity. The data they put out is well-respected. What we are trying to do is sort of use sort of that independent data. The data they use is all publicly available. So mostly from the American Community Survey, from the Bureau of Labor Standards, and, and so on. And when they looked at, so that $58 billion that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation was, came, came from McKinsey, and what they looked at was what it would take to get to gender parity in the United States. And they found that there were really six factors in the states that emerged or what they call six impact zone. One is the representation in leadership and management. Two is the time spent in unpaid work, the proportion of single mothers, the incidence of teenage pregnancy, 
political representation, and then finally violence against women. So if we are to address these six areas, then we can get to gender parity in, in our region. So just a quick snapshot of what this looks like across the states. We fall somewhere in between. Illinois falls somewhere in between at 0.67, I think. So not doing too badly. The best is sort of Maine, which is a small state, Maine or Delaware. And, and Chicago and the Chicago region is also pretty similar. Um, we are somewhere in the middle. Of, we, we, we could make, uh, as I said, an influx. We could bring in an influx of 58 billion. If we did sort of three things, one is increase the participation of women in the labor force. Second is change the sector mix. So having more women in technology certainly is part of that solution. And then sort of the third is getting women on a track to management and supervision. Um, so how does this look a year or two on from when we started the project? We looked at the numbers recently, we looked at the numbers uh, this year, and we see that we're making progress in terms of political participation in our state. While we don't have uh, a female mayor, or, nor do we have any female running for governor, um, the political representation broadly in terms of uh, state legislatures looks not bad. We're number five across um, all the states. Our labor participation has moved up slightly from the time that McKinsey collected this data to, to this past year. Um, women are doing much better in terms of higher education. The places where we haven't made a lot of progress are in terms of women in leadership. This is women in supervisory and managerial positions. Um, the issue of teen pregnancy continues to be stagnant. And then the third area is the issue of violence against women, where we have the most opportunity in, in our region. So this brings me then to what can you do? We invite you to participate in the 100% project and be one of the 100. Uh, we invite you to join us in conversations around ending bias. Uh, we do it annually in March uh, through a, a, a week-long series of conversation that we invite you to host called Talk It Out. And finally, be a champion for change. We, we really invite male CEOs to be champions for change because we believe that they, uh, the, the top of the pyramid is really where you can start making change within your own companies and within your own corporation. And, and for those of you who are interested in community philanthropy, in, um, in giving back to your community in a, very fin in a financial way as well as doing it collaboratively with a, with a group of other like-minded people, we invite you to join us um, to join us through a giving council at Chicago Foundation for Women. And my colleague Ellie Marsh is here, and you can learn more about all the giving councils we have. We have a Young Women's Giving Council. We have uh, an LBTQ Giving Council. Uh, we have a Women United Giving Council, um, and, and then a couple of geographic councils, one on the North Shore and one in the western suburbs. So we, we try to have an opportunity for, for everyone. That's all I have for this evening. Um, thank you. I'm open for questions. All right. No way for this there. That was, thank you. Anybody with questions, please raise your hand. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Um, sorry if this puts you on the spot a little bit, but I have a question I'd be interested in your answer. Um, so, like here at Hack Night itself, we try to like work towards being as inclusive as possible. But one of the problems that we have is we have a lot of breakout groups that work on individual projects, and anyone can start a breakout group at any time. But what we've noticed over time is that a uh, greater percentage of people who start and lead their God groups are men, and not as many women relative to the share of attendees start their God groups as men. 
And I was wondering if you had any advice or like things that we could try or interesting ideas to try to change that or if that's even the right direction to be looking at with that. Yeah, so I, I would ask um, the women in this room if there is a reason that you don't start. There, certainly data shows that women are willing to take on re leadership roles at the same rates as men. So it's not something inherently that we don't do. But we also have enough sort of um, stories about techno tech technology and technology companies and the role of men and women in technology companies and what that does. Um, so I don't know if that plays a role, but I'd love to hear what women in the room have to say about wh whether that is, why that is, or if that is. All right, other questions? I think it's fine. Or comments? Yeah, fine. This question for time, we have to care for our families, we have to work, we have to care for our lot things, so it's really just a, a matter of time constraint. So, so I think one of the solutions, it sounds like, is um, looking, so, the, w w and we, we see this, so when we think about a gender lens, we think about the lives of women and all of the things that they need to take care of. It's not just going to work and coming home, they take care of families and children. So do you make this available in, you know, are these nights uh, at a time that women can participate and stay and work together? Is it safe for them to stay? Um, what, what kind of opportunities do you have so that it, there is a flexible arrangement so that women can work together? So, so those are sort of some of the things that um, one might think about in terms of a solution. Does that make sense? So I studied engineering and I've worked in the tech field my entire career and I would say it's make space for women. Like when they have ideas and suggestions, sometimes it's hard as a woman to kind of get your point across or the guys will just kind of trounce on it. I know you probably don't do that on purpose, but in general it just seems like we get question mark or like we have to have tons of data and examples on why it should work. And if a guy says the exact same thing, like, while well, my words are still vibrating in the air, and they're like, oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> so try to do that less, or if a woman says something, pause for a moment, or just acknowledge that she said something and, they, and just respond to it before you move on to the next idea. And I think that's, that's a great response. And there's actually um, data, there's actually research that, that proves that that that's, is the case. Um, a group of researchers from Harvard recently did a study in looking at um, how questions were given by VCs particularly to women versus men. And, and there's, there's a big difference in terms of how one, one is more inspiring. When, when you talk to men, the questions are more inspiring. And when it talks to women, they're more quantitative and, and, not, and limiting, actually, in, in terms of what happens. So, None of this is necessarily conscious, and that's why we get to this whole issue of unconscious bias and thinking about implicit bias and things like that. Pertinent to starting a, a breakout group, um, I think for me, my experience here was that I needed to be given permission in order to start one, and since the rules to start it aren't clear at all, but the rules, because there are no rules. So, and I think um, perhaps uh, someone, maybe a man, might be used to not waiting for permission, rather just taking initiative, whereas I feel like I needed someone to be like, this is okay for anyone to do, and here's how it's done. Second thing um, is that I think, uh, my, my opinion of the day is that if you are a man, you should just assume that you're part of the problem. Um, no matter how enlightened you are, it doesn't matter how many articles you've read or what you've tweeted, sometimes you're still sexist. So just assume that you're doing something wrong, like we probably all are, and use that as an approach to learn, because if you already think you know, then you can't learn how to change your behavior. Well, that, that was, those were strong fighting words. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I don't know that I endorse all of that. <laughs> and I call myself a feminist, so there you are. Um, but but I, I think certainly it, uh, it does come with some privilege. That, you know, we, we all can recognize the, the privilege we bring to a space, um, whether it's being male, whether it's being white, whether it's education, whether it's, it's class. So certainly there is, that is part of it, I think. I think that's what you're getting at. And for us each to uh, recognize the privilege we bring into any space is, is important. I think I like what you said about rules. Um, I don't know if that is necessarily a gender thing, but I invite um, all the women in this room and, and your friends to step into your space and break the rules. Other questions? Hi, um, my question is, uh, my main focus is sustainability in the environment, and I see a lot of uh, women groups talking about women in tech, and making that like a focus. And I feel like a lot of women don't want to be in tech. Um, and, you know, I, I look at the feminine throughout evolutionary history as far as uh, men were hunters and gatherers, and uh, men were hunters, women were gatherers. And not to be sexist, but I, I know, I know. But the point is, you guys, um, I think there's a, there should be more of a focus on women in environmental um, and sustainability. And I just see a, a more focus on women in tech. So do you guys have any focus in, in women? So we, we really believe that the uh, climate change is going to affect women disproportionately and especially women um, in, in poor communities and women in the global south. Um, they are really going to face a huge impact of, on uh, climate change. So it is, it is imperative that not just women, but, but all of us really think about what it means for our society and for our communities. While CFW doesn't have a specific focus on sustainability or on the environment, we know that it is absolutely something to be concerned about. And, and it is going to impact women disproportionately. Um, you mentioned the uh, community grant making. Um, economic empowerment is probably one of the biggest impactful things. And I was really happy to hear about it. Would you be able to give an example of a particular program? I'm just curious about what kind of uh, ventures got funded through the organization and what kind of impact it had. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you uh, two examples, one of each kind. One is um, we are really concerned about low-income working women getting to uh, a sustainable wage and getting to a career uh, and and talking about technology uh, so so the, the kinds of programs that we support uh, I'll give you one example It's called the Jane Adams Resource Corporation we fund them for a program called women in manufacturing they uh, teach women specific skills around welding around advanced manufacturing and, and machining. So the, the, the idea is that these, uh, the program, again, taking into considera uh, consideration the gender lens, it's offered at a time that women can actually participate. They have access to childcare. They have access to financial supports. They go through the program, uh, the skills-based program, which goes for about nine months. There's a very strong retention rate, and women who leave the program get placed because we look at organizations that also have a relationship with an employer. So women who leave that program end up with jobs at the end of it, which pay for 18, 20, 22 dollars an hour. So getting to that family sustaining wage. So that's one example. So we focus on organizations, training organizations that are linked to jobs and also training organizations that are training in skills that lead to 
um, living wage jobs, and then the, the credits are stackable. So you don't necessarily have need a four-year degree or you don't necessarily need an advanced degree in order to make that uh, family sustaining wage. So that's one example. So that's one piece that is working with one woman at a time that only goes so far. The other side of that is, as I said, focus on the policy issue. So then we are concerned about things like paid sick leave. Over 40% of uh, women in low-wage jobs don't have any days of paid sick leave. You, you probably know re restaurant workers. You probably know, uh, particularly think about restaurant workers. You are in their restaurants, and uh, uh, they're coming to work sick. And, and, and you know sneezing over your food or coughing over your food. You don't want that, but it's not good for the worker themselves and for them not to have uh, paid leave. So we now, so we, we funded advocates who, are, who worked on that policy to get us paid sick leave. So two sides of that coin. Sort of long answer to your question, but. We have time for this last question. Um, so I'm wondering, what kinds of uh, concrete measures do you take to combat assumptions? Like, sort of a, like, not trying to call you out here, but like historical assumptions of like what women can or can't do based on what has historically been things that women have done or have been trained or assumed to be good at um, in one way or another. And again, not calling you out, like, I know it's not a, I'm sure you didn't mean any harm, but uh, but like, what kinds of things would you do in order to try and correct someone in those kind of instances? I guess I didn't understand your question. If you can sort of rephrase yeah. that. Oh sure. Um, so basically, I'm just wondering, like, what are some concrete measures you would take to try and break biases that people might have? Um, kind of, you know essentialist ideas of like what women can or can't do based on what they historically have been able to do or have done or uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, so you, you're, you're talking about changing hearts and minds, right? So it's one thing to change one's mind. You know, all the data in the world may not change hearts, right? There is enough data now and and you you probably seen after the infamous google memo all of the data that came out you know so certainly there there's data to to indicate that there's not a lot of difference that's not sometimes very helpful some sometimes you know it, it's about doing the work and being recognized for it it's it's about stepping up and at the end of the day um, do you really want to try and convince someone who's not ready to be convinced? And is it worth it? That's a question I ask you to ask. So one of my staff recently told me, well, you just stand up there and say what, what you really mean to say. You say what you mean, is what, what she said to me. And I'm like, I don't know to be anyone else. She says, you don't care that people may not, there may be some people who don't like you. It's like, yeah, so, so what? I know what I can do and be confident. So uh, again, I want to tell you that what we do is not about fixing women. So everything that I talked about hopefully makes it clear that what we are about is it's not about fixing women. It's about fixing structures. It's about fix, fixing the structural uh, imbalances. This is not about fixing women. So, it's, so I don't want to go out and fix men either. That's, that's not my job nor does it make sense. So we have to fix the systems and the structures. So that's the place we, where we can make a difference. I hope, I hope that makes sense. It's not the answer, perhaps, that you'd like me to give you. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. That's what I'm wondering about how you fix uh, those structures. Like, is there a way? So, so that's, that's why we focus on things like HR policies. That's why we fix, uh, look at things like uh, unusual collaborations, we, we, we think that young boy, we, we think that gender norms are a big issue. So let's look at that next generation about how we're raising young boys and young girls and what we're teaching them. Let's look at what are the 
what are the, the structural factors in terms of thinking about how our companies are run, kind of who gets to be in the boardroom, who gets to be the CEO, and what, what, are, what are the impacts of that. And kind of, you know, it, it, it's, it's sort of at every level. Who gets hired, who gets promoted? You know, it's, it's all of those factors, right? So ultimately, if there are, if, if you, can, you can see that, then things will change. Unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of time. Thank you all very much. <laughs>